we'll be working on is chapter 18, which uh, covers classification. And classification is, of course, where we're going to group organisms into different categories based on their characteristics. There are 13 billion known species of organisms, and this is only 5% of all organisms that have ever lived. Um, new organisms are still being found and identified even today in uh, remote places where they go into jungles and other areas that have um, been difficult for humans to get to. Uh, they are finding lots of new species or deep down in the bottom of the um, ocean where they've been unable to explore. They are also finding very unique organisms. So the definition of classification is classification is the arrangement of organisms into their orderly groups based upon similarities. And you can see by my lovely drawings that I haven't done this in a while. I'm kind of rusty. Um, once again, classification is the arrangement of organisms into orderly groups based on their similarities. And the categories are going to start very broad and then go to very specific. Classification is also known as taxonomy. So you will see this is a more scientific term, but it means the same thing as classification. Taxonomists, and you can tell by looking at this that we are referring to people. Taxonomists are scientists that identify and name organisms. Why do we classify? Well, we want to accurately and uniformly, and uniformly means um, the same, uh, names for organisms. So what this does is it prevents what are called misnomers. And misnomers are, for example, starfish and jellyfish aren't really fish. So those are common names that we give organisms based upon basically um, a very simple observation. Um, starfish, of course, they look like a star based upon their shape. But they're actually an echinoderm. And jellyfish, they are given that because they're so squishy, but um, they are not in the same category as the starfish. And they aren't fish either. They don't have fins and gills, and they don't have lungs. Um, what we use now are the same language in order to name these, and we use Latin or Greek when we're scientifically naming organisms. Um, so, for example, this, we call this a seahorse, but it's not really a seahorse because it's not a horse. One of the other reasons that we use Latin in order to classify um, certain things is because then it's a common language amongst all scientists despite the language that they speak. So if we're looking at this um, picture of what we would call the skunk, and there's the skunk, you know, here you're going to have it in French, here it's going to be in German, here it's going to be in Spanish, um, here it's what we call it in English. But if we were all scientists who are taxonomists, we would call the skunk Mephitis Mephitis. So that, when they see that, they all know that to us in our common language, is a skunk. Early taxonomists 
The earliest one was Aristotle, and that was 2,000 years ago. So he was the first taxonomist. There are two people that are key into the unit of classification. The first one is Aristotle, and he classified things or grouped things into two categories. He was very simple. Of course, he didn't have the technology that, technology that we have today. So he basically said that he put them into two groups, the plant group and the animal group. And he said the plants were based upon their stems and the animals were based upon where they lived. So air, land, water. And the plants were based upon the type of stem that they have. Did they have a soft green stem? Did they have a woody stem, which is like the tree trunk, or did they have something that we would think of as just a branch? Or bushes are, are what we would call them. They're more of a uh, kind of in between the soft green one, which is our flowers, and these would be our trees. So that's how he categorized, categorized the, them into two groups. Um, he subdivided them by their habitat, which would be, once again, the habitat went for the animals. And I told you that already. Carolus Linnaeus, he is the, we'll call him the father of classification. We knew that Mendel was the father of genetics. Well, Linnaeus is the classification guy. So he was an 18th century taxonomist. Um, he classified organisms by their structures. And he developed the naming system that we still use today, which is called binomial nomenclature. So the two people that you need to know are Carolus Linnaeus and Aristotle. Aristotle was the first guy, Linnaeus was the second. So once again, oh, and that is what he used as his, his writing or his document, the Systema Naturale, was his book that he wrote. Uh, once again, Linnaeus is the father of taxonomy. He developed the modern system of naming known as binomial nomenclature. And from your reading guide, you will know that bi, oops, okay, that bi stands for two and nomial stands for name. So binomial nomenclature is a two word name and those two words are genus, which is the first one, and species, which is the second one. The genus is always a capital letter, the species is always lowercase, and there are going to be rules as to how these particular um, animals are named. So binomial nomenclature is used to name genus and species. They're usually written in italics. Uh, they're Latin or Greek. Once again, italicized when it is in print. And we capitalize the genus, but not the species. And finally, if you are writing them, not typed, but handwritten, you underline the genus and the species when you are writing them. So if we look at this bird that's over here on the left, we call it a robin. But its Latin name is Turdus migratorius. As you can see, the genus is capitalized and the species is lowercase.
And once again, this is the American Robin. If we looked at these three pictures, you would think that they were all bears. Well, they're not. If we look at their genus and species, the panda is not the same as the polar bear and the grizzly bear. You can see that the polar bear ursus and the grizzly bear ursus have the same genus. This means that these two are more closely related to each other than they are to the panda because the panda is in a totally different genus. But once again, we think of these three as bears, but when we look at their scientific name, the panda here is nowhere near as close as both the polar bear and the grizzly bear are. Rules for naming organisms. The, the, per, the group that um, is instrumental in this is called the International Code for Binomial Nomenclature, which contains the rules for naming organisms. Um, all names must be approved by the International Naming Congress, sometimes also called the International Zoological Conference, Congress, and the reason for this is because this prevents duplicated names. They can't have, no two species can have the same name. Uh, as far as classification groups, taxon is the category into which related organisms are placed. And there is a hierarchy, and the word hierarchy means from top to bottom. So that would be hierarchy. If we were looking at um, um, something, it would be from the largest down to the smallest. That's what hierarchy is. Um, and of course, it says right here, from the broadest to the most specific. So that's what hierarchy means. From the largest group to the smallest or most specific group. These are the groups that we classify them in with domain being the largest and species being the smallest. Now, one thing that you are going to have to remember is the order that these go in. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. In middle school, sometimes you're taught what's called a mnemonic so that you can remember these in a specific order. Once again, domain is the largest, and then we come to kingdom. The next category that gets more specific is phylum. This is one key thing that you need to remember. If we are classifying plants, we would say domain, kingdom, division when it comes to plants. You will need to remember that. When we are talking about plants, once again, you go domain, kingdom, and division instead of phylum. So it's domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then finally species. Once again, domain is the broadest. And as far as a mnemonic, once again a mnemonic is a way that you remember the first initial and then associate it with a different meaning. So, for example, for kingdom, King Philip came over for gooseberry soup. Sometimes they would say King Philip came over for and instead of gooseberry soup, it might be for the G 
good. And then for the S, spaghetti. So that's another way of, if you remember, King Philip came over for good spaghetti. You would then have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species.